Now I would like to turn over to Professor Gregory um, Copeland, uh, who will be bringing us closer to nuclear Asia, multipolar nuclear Asia, talk a little bit about Asia region. Uh, Professor Copeland is Director of Biodefense Graduate Program in the Shah School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. He's also Associate Faculty at the Center for Global Studies of George Mason University and a member of the Scientist Working Group on Chemical and Biological Weapons at the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation in Washington, D.C. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Copeland. Before um, I, I talk about the, uh, the, the future of strategic stability in a multipolar nuclear Asia, uh, it's very important to define what do I mean by strategic stability and what I mean by a, a multipolar nuclear Asia. Um, strategic stability is a term that's been around for a long time, but it has uh, many different meanings to different people in different countries. Uh, four years ago, I wrote a report for the Council on Foreign Relations that looked at uh, strategic stability in the second nuclear age, and in that report I define strategic stability as a condition where the risk of war, of nuclear war, is low because both sides have the ability to, um, uh, both sides have the, uh, neither side, sorry, neither side has the incentive to strike first against their enemy, both sides have the ability to retaliate if necessary, and neither side expects those calculations to change suddenly or unexpectedly. And under those conditions, states will face less pressure to escalate during a crisis. Uh, they will face uh, less pressure to uh, launch a strike early, um, and they will face less pressure to engage in arms races. Now, in um, uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, we entered a new uh, strategic environment that's been called the Second Nuclear Age. And it's been called this because we went from having a bipolar nuclear order between the United States and the Soviet Union uh, to an, an order where you have multiple states with nuclear weapons um, that are of concern. Uh, and this is strictly true in Asia, where you have India, Pakistan, China, and of course now North Korea as nuclear weapon states. Now all these states had nuclear weapons at the time the Cold War ended, but during the 1990s all these countries uh, dramatically accelerated their nuclear and missile programs, um, and India and Pakistan took their first nuclear test in 1998, um, uh, Pakistan conducted their first test, or sorry, North Korea conducted their first test in 2006. Uh, and so we now find ourselves in an era where you have multiple nuclear weapon states uh, in Asia. Um, and what's most important though here is not the absolute number of states with these weapons, but increasingly complex deterrence relationships uh, between them and between them and other countries with nuclear weapons around the world. And so what we have is what I call a, uh, the new geometry of deterrence. Uh, and this is different from the Cold War, where the United States and Soviet Union face a security dilemma, where the actions by one state might threaten a second state, where they respond in ways that make the first state less secure. And uh, as illustrated by this uh, diagram, um, all of the nuclear weapon states now face multiple countries that they view as potential nuclear threats. So the United States views potential threats coming from Russia, from China, from North Korea, from Pakistan. Russia, meanwhile, looks at both the US, uh, NATO, possibly China as nuclear threats. Uh, and China looks at the US, uh, and perhaps India, and perhaps Russia as nuclear threats. And so because you have this um, interaction of states with multiple uh, concerns about who they're trying to deter, this makes it much more complicated than the Cold War era was really just two major nuclear superpowers facing off against one another. Now if you combine this complex geometry um, with what is called a security trilemma, you start to see how complicated this new nuclear age uh, really is. Uh, a security trilemma is a situation where the actions of one state takes to defend itself against a second state uh, inadvertently threatens a third state that then responds in ways that makes the original state less secure. Um, and this is uh, something that was not really a major concern during the Cold War, but has emerged in, in several different ways uh, in, in the second nuclear age. And as a result of this more complex geometry of deterrence and, this, and the security trilemma, the effects or the, the actions of one nuclear state can have a cascading effect, a ripple effect, on the entire um, nuclear order. Uh, 
probably the best example we have now of a security trilemma is uh, the deployment of the THAAD missile defense system to South Korea by the United States. Um, starting in, in 2016, the United States deployed the terminal high altitude area defense system called THAAD to South Korea in response to South Korea, uh, North Korea's uh, increasing uh, tests of uh, short range, medium range, intermediate range missiles that are a threat to both the US and South Korea. At the time, China strongly opposed this deployment. Um, they opposed it so much that they placed a kind of informal, unofficial boycott uh, on South Korea, including banning Chinese tourists from visiting the country, banning K-pop bands from visiting uh, 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 China and going on tour, uh, and this had a major impact on trade between South Korea and China, uh, to the effect the South Korean economy losing uh, between seven and eight billion dollars as a result of these Chinese um, economic pressure. Uh, this was probably the biggest low point between South Korea and Chinese relations since the end of the Cold War. So this was a, this was a major uh, kind of diplomatic geopolitical uh, outcome. So well, why was China so upset about that? Because the United States deployed that you know, for the purpose of defending Korea against North Korean missiles. Why were the Chinese upset? Um, and the Chinese perception was that because of the power of, uh, of the THAAD radar system, because of its position on the Korean Peninsula, that radar would give the United States a, a special capability to uh, observe Chinese warheads in flight towards the United States in the event of a conflict between the United States and China. And if this system passed that data to the U.S. National Missile Defense System, it would give the U.S. an increased ability to shoot down Chinese warheads in the event of a conflict. And so this was a system that China perceived as being a threat to their strategic deterrent. And given how small the Chinese strategic arsenal is, they are very sensitive to anything that they think undermines their ability to retaliate in the event of a conflict. And again, one of the key tenets of strategic stability is the idea that a country needs to have that assured capability to retaliate in the event of a crisis or war as a way of making it feel um, secure. And the that system uh, undermined these Chinese confidence that they would have that ability in the event of a, of a conflict. So even though the United States and South Korea were justified in, in um, deploying that to defend against the North Korean threat, they inadvertently created a, a security threat to the Chinese who responded in ways uh, that were um, uh, you know, very costly to South Korea and upset uh, Chinese relations with both countries. You see this also play out in, uh, in, in Europe with Russia. Uh, the Russians were very sensitive to the deployment of a U.S. missile defense system into Europe, which was designed to defend against the Iranian missiles, and yet Russia views that system as being a threat to their strategic arsenal as well. So the security type trilemma is unfortunately an increasingly common phenomenon that we're seeing uh, in ways that we haven't really experienced before. Uh, the second uh, area where we see challenges to strategic stability is the development of new technologies that interact with nuclear forces in ways that we've not seen before. During the Cold War, the, only, uh, the major ingredient for uh, measuring strategic stability were comparing nuclear forces of, of two different countries. Only nuclear weapons can be used to destroy other nuclear weapons. So if you want to understand what is the balance of power, what is the deterrence, you compare each country's nuclear forces to one another. What we've seen, uh, because of advances in technology, of emerging technologies like ballistic missile defenses, long-range precision strike, uh, cyber war weapons, and anti-slide weapons, that can have effects that either replicate, or mitigate, or offset the effects of nuclear weapons. And so now when you want to measure what is the strategic stability situation, you have to look not just at what is the, the nuclear forces at play, but how these other emerging technologies affect nuclear forces and their ability to be used in the event of a, a crisis or, or conflict. And so um, when you look at the kind of traditional understanding of what is strategic stability, what uh, are some of the factors that can lead it to being uh, more unstable, uh, factors such as you know, weapons that rely on surprise for their effectiveness, uh, unreliable command and control systems, um, uh, weapons that have you know, high rates of, of uh, false alarms, early warning systems that have false alarms, fragile command and control systems that can fail during a crisis, leadership that is uh, susceptible or afraid of decapitation attacks or disruptions of command and control. All these kinds of factors can make countries feel less secure and reduce the, ability, the, the stability that they have during a crisis. Um, unfortunately, we see many of these capabilities <laughs> present not only in Asia but on the Korean uh, peninsula. So I just want to have a two, well, maybe, maybe one, if, so I don't take up too much time. Um, the, the first one I want to highlight is the proliferation of um, 
uh, long-range precision strike missiles in Asia. Um, since the early 2000s, we've seen a, a growing capability across the entire region for being able to conduct precision strikes using ballistic missiles and cruise missiles um, across the entire region. China is the largest and oldest such program. Uh, they now have a very large arsenal of short-range, medium-range, intermediate-range ballistic missiles and cruise missiles uh, that use conventional warheads uh, to attack targets, but they can do so with a high degree of precision, which uh, makes them much more uh, uh, devastating than the old Scud missiles that we used to worry about during the first Iraq war, which maybe would hit a target, you know, within a given kilometer. Um, now these are uh, more advanced systems that can hit a target within 10 meters or so. So very highly uh, accurate and therefore much more uh, devastating. Um, South Korea uh, has also developed uh, a, a suite of increasingly capable uh, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Um, that have both precision strike and what's called bunker busting capabilities, the ability to attack targets that are buried underground or are hardened in, in some way. Uh, and the U.S. has recently lifted the payload restrictions on the systems that South Korea can deploy, and so it's expected that South Korea will deploy even more advanced versions of their uh, Hanmu and uh, uh, ballistic missile and, and cruise missile in, in the near future. Uh, even North Korea, which is not known for having uh, a very strong, uh, uh, advanced, uh, conventional military capability has deployed its own version of these missiles. Um, uh, last year in a parade, they demonstrated it and they later tested a Scud missile, you know, these old-fashioned Scud missiles, but they put a terminal guidance uh, system in the warhead so it would enable it to maneuver on the way uh, to re-entry and be able to target uh, much more precisely than the old-fashioned Scuds that we saw back during, during the Iraq War. Um, there are signs that other countries like Japan are increasingly interested in these getting these capabilities as well. Uh, Japan's talked about either buying Tomahawk cruise missiles from the United States or developing their own. So again, there's, this, there's a trend of these weapons both increasing in number, sophistication, variety, the number of countries that are, that are seeking them. And this is playing out particularly in uh, South Korea. Uh, and the role of precision strike weapons has taken on a, a much more important role in South Korea's security strategy in recent years. There are now two different uh, South Korean military doctrines. One is called Kill Chain, the other is the Korea Massive Punishment and Retaliation Doctrine that rely heavily on the precision guided munitions in the event of a conflict uh, with North Korea. Uh, if a North Korean attack was believed to be uh, imminent, uh, South Korea um, plans on using its precision guided munitions in a preemptive attack to go after North Korean WD sites, uh, long range artillery sites, or missile sites as a way of preempting an attack um, from, from occurring. Um, this would not uh, target the North Korean leadership, however. This would go out only after the weapons that might be a threat to, to South Korea. In the event of an actual uh, Korean attack, uh, either a large scale conventional attack or one using weapons of mass destruction, uh, the South Korean Massive Punishment Retaliation Plan involves attacks not only on the range of what weapons that North Korea has, also attacks on the leadership targets within North Korea itself. Uh, what are we called decapitation or beheading strikes to try and uh, kill the, the leadership, the political military leadership within North Korea as a way of ending uh, the conflict and, and preventing future uh, attacks by North Korea. Um, before the most recent thaw in relations between, between South Korea and, and North Korea, both sides were making threats against each other's leadership. Uh, South Korean military officials uh, made uh, references in the media to being able to send uh, missiles into the window of Kim Jong-un's mansion. Uh, the North Koreans built a scale model of the Blue House that they use for target practice. Uh, and these were ways of both sides saying the message that your leadership is a uh, potential target and you need to be, you need to be worried about it. Uh, what's particularly disturbing in, in this context is given the very short uh, distances in, in uh, the, the Korean Peninsula in terms of the distance of Pyongyang and Seoul from the border, the flight time of missiles that are being used in these kinds of attacks is measured in minutes. So there would be little to no warning if uh, North or South Korea decided to launch one of these kind of preemptive decapitating types of, of attacks. And this raises a number of potential dangers. Uh, the creation of preemptive military doctrines that rely on exquisite intelligence and surprise uh, put great pressure on political leaders to uh, uh, act early in a crisis, uh, to launch with incomplete or inaccurate information, um, and uh, creates a dilemma that if one side has that doctrine, uh, the other side also feels that it must adopt a similar doctrine in order to preempt the preemption. Uh, and so you get into kind of an arms race of political decision making where each side feels they need to go first before the other side goes first and makes it impossible for them to respond uh, in kind. Um, and especially when you're dealing with a regime as centralized and paranoid as, as North Korea, threats to the, the leadership are taken extremely seriously. 
Uh, and this is uh, something we saw back during the Cold War, where the Soviet Union was extremely concerned about uh, U.S. deployment of certain uh, weapons into Europe that could have reached Moscow with a very short notice, very short warning. Uh, and the Soviet Union invested a massive effort in trying to develop strategies to avoid that threat and try and, and respond to it uh, in ways that actually uh, made uh, you know, crises even more uh, unstable. And so even though South Korea doesn't currently have the ability to implement either of these military doctrines, uh, North Korea will, for its own sake, will have to assume that either North, South Korea will have that ability soon um, or that they will be able to uh, uh, develop that capability on their own or, or do it with the assistance of, of allies like the United States. And so if North Korea believes that this is an a, uh, operational doctrine that is a direct threat to their leadership, they're likely to respond with their own doctrines of preemption, rapid decision making, um, that during a crisis can be particularly destabilizing because leaders will be making decisions very rapidly under fear that if they make the wrong decision, right, their lives are forfeit. Um, and so it, it risks the survival of the regime, which is something that they will, you know, they, they take uh, you know, extremely uh, seriously. Um, I will uh, skip the, the cyber discussion. Um, uh, we can definitely talk about that during, during the Q&A since it's something that is obviously of concern uh, now since they're still continuing uh, use of cyber weapons by North Korea against, against South Korea. Um, let me just get to kind of my, my takeaway conclusions here. Um, and unfortunately, as you might have gathered from this, from this talk, I, I don't think the prospects for strategic stability uh, in Asia or the Korean Peninsula are very good at this point. Um, many of the trends that I described in my report four years ago are even worse now. Many of them are present both in Asia generally and also within the Korean Peninsula uh, specifically. Hopefully, improved relations between North Korea and South Korea. Uh, hopefully, the summit between uh, President Trump and Mr. Kim will lead to uh, a reduction of tensions between these countries. Uh, but I am personally fairly skeptical that uh, we will see any kind of breakthrough in uh, U.S. North Korean relations in denuclearization. Uh, and so, uh, what we're going to have to do is find ways to uh, live with North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. Um, and adapt to this new geometry of deterrence that we find ourselves in, recognizing that China is a major player that uh, will automatically be very concerned with any developments on the Korean Peninsula, whether it's driven by the U.S. or driven by South Korea. Um, the, North, the, the Chinese will look at that as having a direct impact on their security. Um, and so therefore we need to be looking at ways to reduce risks of uh, crises, of miscalculations, uh, and of um, uh, inadvertent escalation uh, in the event of uh, a crisis that begins uh, either on the DMZ um, or, or elsewhere. Um, thank you, and uh, look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you. I guess it's uh, way more complicated than what we think we know. It's not only about denuclearization, but we actually have multiple nuclear states plus new technology and more weapons, missiles. I guess there are a lot to discuss about.